Uh, and so now we're going to move on to the next part of the class, which is thinking about the efficiency cost of taxation rather than the incidence of taxation. Let me give you an outline of this part of the class, uh, and then we'll uh, get into some of the material. So we're going to start by talking about um, Marshallian surplus, which is the simplest way to think about the efficiency cost of taxes, but is not really grounded in a welfare measure. And so even though it ends up working in some contexts, which we'll talk about, it's not derived from uh, utility maximization theory, and so it's not really uh, the thing you want to start from in the end. We'll then th talk about the problems with Marshallian surplus, which arise in particular when you have income effects, and it leads to something called the path dependence problem, which I'll discuss. We'll then turn to what are the measures of excess burden that are actually used in the literature, which require definitions of equivalent variation, compensating variation, and excess burden uh, with income effects. Some of this stuff is going to touch on, hopefully, what you saw in earlier price theory uh, introductory economics classes, but we'll go through it. Uh, then we'll talk about the most widely used formula for measuring the efficiency cost of taxes, which is the Harberger approximation. We'll contrast that with a different approach, which is an exact measure of deadweight loss and an exact measure of consumer surplus, which is due to Hausman in 1981. And this distinction is going to be the first place where we see the distinction between sort of the structural approach and the sufficient statistic approach, which we'll come back to many times in the class. We'll then talk about a few empirical applications, and then uh, we'll end by talking about how you translate these concepts to behavioral models uh, where people are not optimizing. So let's start uh, with just the definitions. So incidence, as we've been discussing, is the effect of policies on the distribution of the economic pie. So how does it get split up across people? The efficiency or deadweight cost can be thought of as the effect of a policy on the size of the economic pie. So if we have the Obama tax plan instead of the Romney tax plan, what, how does that affect total GDP as a crude way to think about uh, efficiency costs of taxes? The focus in efficiency analysis as a result is on quantities and not on prices. Okay? So some references, which hopefully some of you have looked at already. There's the Auerbach Handbook chapter, which has a good classic introduction to this material. And there are certain sections which are highlighted in the syllabus which are most relevant. Our more recent paper talks about the behavioral economics approach to this and rederives some of the simple efficiency cost formulas. Then the discussion of sufficient statistics is covered in my annual review article, and we'll talk about that at some length. So you should be familiar with that, because we'll talk about various applications of that idea. And then just for the background on the price theory concepts like equivalent compensating variation, Hicksian demand functions, uh, uh, and so forth. If that stuff is not familiar, take a look at MWG chapter three. Okay, so uh, what is the efficiency cost of taxes about? So government basically raises taxes for one of two reasons. It's to raise revenue to finance public goods, like we want to build schools or highways, or it's to redistribute income, right? So we want to tax the rich and maybe give money to lower income individuals. Now the key idea of efficiency cost of taxes is that in order to generate $1 of revenue, I need to reduce the welfare of the people I'm taxing by more than $1 because the tax distorts behavior. So in other words, there's what people refer to as a marginal cost of public funds, which is not zero. In order to generate $1,000, we have to take, say, $1,200 from the economy. And the key question is, how do we measure that $200 gap, and what does it depend on, and where does it come from? That leads, so that's a positive question. That leads to the optimal policy question, which we're building towards. All these in early lectures are building towards optimal tax policy, which we'll get to in a couple of lectures in this class. So the question we're going to end up asking is, how do we implement policies that minimize these efficiency costs? Uh, so we're going to start with a positive analysis of how to measure the efficiency cost of a given tax system, and then we'll talk about how to minimize. Marshallian surplus. So this is the kind of thing you'd learn in like an Act 10 type of class. Uh, so where does it come from? Let's be rigorous about what uh, Marshallian surplus uh, requires in terms of assumptions. First and most importantly, it requires quasi-linear utility. That means that there are no income effects on the good that's being taxed. 
So in other words, if I gave you an extra $100, you wouldn't buy more bananas because you bought enough bananas and you're going to spend your residual money on something else. So that's what quasi-linear utility is. We'll write this down in a second. It's a very standard assumption. So what does that do? First, it eliminates income effects. Second, it's a money metric. Money metric means that uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about how many utils people are losing. It makes sense to talk about how many dollars they're losing, right? That's a meaningful unit. And in the case of quasi-linear utility, utility is measured in dollars directly because one of the goods is uh, as a price of one and you're spending money one for one on that good. So uh, utility has a money metric interpretation. So we don't need to convert utility to dollar units, which is a complication that arises when we drop this functional form assumption. The second assumption is that we have competitive production just as in the incidence analysis, okay? So here's the setup. We have two goods, X and Y. It's gonna be a partial equilibrium uh, type analysis to start. The consumer has wealth Z and a quasi-linear utility function U of X plus Y. So what is a quasi-linear utility function? It's linear in one good and it's concave in the other good. That is gonna generate the property that the demand for X does not depend upon Z, right? The optimal uh, consumption of X is gonna be at the point where the marginal utility of X equals the price. And then all the residual income that you get is gonna be spent on Y. Uh, and so what the consumer does is solves this optimization problem where he maximizes his utility subject to the budget constraint, which is just P plus tau, tau denotes the tax year, times consumption of X plus Y, where we assume Y is the numeraire, so it has a normalized price of one, equals total wealth. Now firms are gonna use the same exact setup as in, in the incidence partial equilibrium model. Firms use C of S units of the numeraire Y to produce S units of good X. So think of firms as basically taking good Y and having a technology to convert it into good X at some cost. The marginal cost of production, we're gonna make the standard regularity assumptions to make this a convex problem. So there's a convex and increasing cost of uh, production. The firm's profit at a pre-tax price of P and level of supply S is just P S minus C of S. Okay, so pretty standard setup, quasi-linear utility assumption. Okay, so with perfect optimization, let's talk about the equilibrium. With perfect optimization, the supply function for X is implicitly defined by the marginal condition uh, that sets the marginal cost of production equal to the price. Uh, and let's let eta S denote the price elasticity of supply defined in the usual way and let Q denote the equilibrium quantity sold of good X. So Q is gonna satisfy this equilibrium condition, which is just supply equals demand, including the, ta uh, the tax. And let's now consider the effect of introducing a small tax D tau uh, on Q and on total surplus, right? So we're gonna do this perturbation where we're starting from D of P equals S of P and then we're introducing the small tax. So this is the initial equilibrium. Let's say we're in a market for good X where the price is $30 and we're selling 1,500 units of the good in equilibrium. Now we introduce this tax on suppliers, let's say that shifts the supply curve inward. That changes the price as we've discussed in the incidence analysis and it reduces the equilibrium quantity to 1,350. That makes the X, okay, so this is what we're interested in now. This leads to an efficiency cost that is a loss in surplus given by the highlighted yellow triangle. Let's uh, think about why, so you've probably seen this picture a few times, why is it intuitively that that triangle measures excess burden? Um, it's because, let's start from this unit here, okay? So the way to think about efficiency cost is that it arises from transactions that don't occur that would have generated surplus. So think about this 1,350th unit of the good. If we produce that next unit, the consumer values it at $36. He's willing to pay $36 for that good. And the producer, it only costs him like $28 to produce that unit of the good. So there's $8 to be gained from that transaction, but that transaction is not occurring because the government has imposed this tax. 
So that's surplus that's lost from the economy, right? Or in another example, in the context of labor supply taxation, I might be willing to work at a given wage, and I can produce something that's worth more than my marginal wage. But because of the tax, that transaction doesn't occur, and the economy is smaller as a result, all right? So now, why do we get that triangle? That is the welfare cost of not uh, producing that unit, and then keep integrating, adding up over the units that are not produced. The welfare cost of not producing this very last unit is essentially zero because the marginal cost of production equals the marginal benefit to the consumer. Uh, and hence, if you just integrate over this, the quantities that are not produced, you end up getting the area between those two curves. That, that's the excess burden of the tax, right? Okay, is that clear? Yes? Deadweight loss, yeah, same thing. Excess burden, deadweight loss are synonyms, yep. Okay, so what do we see from that graph? First important property is excess burden increases with the square of the tax rate rather than linearly with the tax rate. Second, excess burden increases with elasticities. So let's look at both of these graphically. Excess burden increases with the square of the tax rate. Okay, so we start from the no tax case introduce a tax. That's the diagram we had before. So we get this triangle of loss that, em uh, that emerges when we introduce a tax starting from zero. Now suppose we again increase the tax by a further 10%. Now we're going to get something that looks like a trapezoid instead of a triangle. And so it's bigger. So you can see that raising the tax uh, from this initial level to the bigger level even if it's the same incremental change, has a bigger deadweight cost. Okay, and can somebody uh, say what the intuition for that is, relating to what I was saying before about loss of surplus, transactions that don't occur? What, why is that? Yeah, Pascal. You're pushing out a transaction that people would value even more. Yes, exactly. So you're starting from a transaction where, which people were already getting like $10 of surplus from, and now the transactions you're destroying have even more surplus that's being lost, right? Whereas if you're starting from a case with no tax, that marginal transaction optimization implies that basically that had second order value. It wasn't really that valuable. Um, and so there's gonna be very little deadweight cost from a small tax, but once you start to make it bigger, you really have a uh, big efficiency cost. The other thing that you see mathematically, and we'll come back to this in some detail, is that the size of this triangle is proportional to T squared. Why do you get T squared? Because the height of the triangle is T, and the length of the triangle is dq dt times t, right? It's the size, the quantity response is also proportional to the tax that you introduce. So there are t's in both the height uh, and, the, and the width. In contrast here, you have this rectangle in the middle, okay, where you already had this pre-existing tax, uh, and that's gonna lead to a first order uh, loss of revenue and a first order excess burden that's proportional to T, okay? So I'll come back to this in more detail, but remember this graph. Okay, the uh, second result, which I had mentioned, are the comparative statics. So you can see that as you make the demand curve more elastic, the size of the deadweight loss triangle is getting bigger. And what's an easy way to see why that is, the height of the triangle is always gonna be T, right? We know the wedge between the producer price and the consumer price has to be T, uh, T units. But the width of the triangle, as you can see, is getting bigger as you have a more elastic demand curve, okay? And so higher elasticities are gonna to lead to more distortions, are gonna to lead to more deadweight loss. So that's why there's a tremendous focus in public finance of estimating the elasticities of behavior with respect to key taxes, like income tax rates, like capital tax rates, like consumption tax rates, and so forth. And a lot of the political debate centers intellectually on how big you think these elasticities are. Okay, so you can already start to see, I just wanna preview a little bit, the implications for tax policy when we're gonna talk about optimal tax, taxation, like the Ramsey rule, which is gonna come in a couple lectures. So you can see that with many goods, the most efficient way to t uh, raise tax revenue is to tax inelastic goods more. That just follows from the graph that I just showed you that generates less deadweight loss. So you would think of things like prescription drugs, which people might be willing to buy at any price, or food, which is gonna be demanded relatively inelastically. Now, obviously, there's a countervailing force here. 
which is we think that the things that people demand inelastically are necessities. So they tend to be consumed disproportionately by lower income people because everyone needs food and everyone wants some health care. And so you get this countervailing force, which is not captured in the simple efficiency analysis, that from a distributional perspective, you probably want to tax inelastic goods less. And so what optimal taxation is really about is balancing these various considerations. The second force that you see already is that because tax, the deadweight loss of tax, taxes rise, rises at a quadratic rate uh, with the tax, you want to spread taxes across all goods to keep tax rates relatively low on all goods. So rather than having a 30% tax on bananas and a 0% tax on apples, you're going to have a lower total deadweight loss if you have a 15% tax on both. And so that is, you kind of see that as a push towards a broad tax base. I see that as somewhat related to this discussion about how we have too many loopholes in our tax system and too narrow of a base. The push towards base broadening, which economists often advocate, is related to this result, all right? Now, you can see that just between these two forces, there's a tension, right? Because this says, find a few inelastic goods and tax them a lot. And the second force says, spread the taxes evenly across a lot of goods. So you can already see how there's going to be some optimal way to trade those two forces off, and that's going to produce an optimal policy. But all of that is going to require, first, quantitatively measuring the size of excess burden so that we can understand what's the size of excess burden in this market versus that market and set the optimal tax rates appropriately. All right, so how do we measure excess burden? So there are three empirically implementable methods of measuring excess burden that people use in practice. Uh, and so what are these? So first is to measure supply and demand elasticities. That's the first thing you'd think of. When I show you those graphs, if I measure the slopes of the supply and demand curves, I can figure out the size of that triangle, right? That's intuitive. The second is to measure the total change in equilibrium quantity that's caused by the tax. So don't worry about distinguishing the relative slopes of the supply and demand curves, just measure actually a simpler thing. What is the reduced form effect of the tax on the quantity sold? And I'll show you how this works. The third, which is not something you might think of initially, but actually works out to be quite convenient, um, is to measure the loss in government revenue from, uh, the, uh, from the tax. And uh, we'll get to that. So uh, most of this stuff and a lot of this lecture is going to be primarily theoretical, so just bear with me as we go through this math. But then you'll see how all this stuff is uh, applied in the data, uh, most likely in the next lecture. OK, so excess burden, if we think about it from a Marshallian surplus point of view, like that simple graph, the easiest way to uh, think about it is it's the size of that triangle, right? So what's the width of that triangle? It's dq, the, the distortion in quantity caused by the tax. And what's the size of the tax we've introduced? It's d tau. So what's the area of the triangle? Half the width times the height, 1 half dq dt. All right. So now I can write dq as the slope of the supply curve times the change in the price induced by the tax. Right. So I make that substitution, and I get this here. Now I'm going to just rewrite this thing so that it looks like an elasticity. So I'm going to divide by s and multiply by s over p. And then here, I'm going to use the incidence formula where I know what dp is from what we discussed previously on how taxes affect producer prices. right? And so that gives me this additional term. Now, I know I'm going through this a little bit quickly, but you, know, you should go over this algebra uh, afterward. And so then when you just collect all the terms uh, and factor, you end up getting this formula here, where excess burden is 1 half times the product of the elasticities divided by the sum of the elasticities times uh, price times quantity times d tau over p squared. Okay. And so as I said, the second line here is using that incidence formula, which we derived before. Now it's useful to note that the amount of revenue the government generates from a tax is q times d tau. So if I introduce a uh, 10 cent tax and you're consuming 10 units of the good, I get a dollar, right? So uh, that's R. And a very common expression which people are interested in, in using in applied work, it's talked about even in like uh, the DC policy debate, is the deadweight burden 
per dollar of tax revenue. Like how much am I going to cost the economy when I generate a dollar of taxes to finance this highway that we want to build? Yep. So this is, is this all assuming that we're starting with zero tax? Yes. And then we're going to talk about the case where we're starting with a positive tax, where it's going to look a little different. So this is the triangle case, and then we're going to talk about the trapezoid case. Okay. Um, okay, so deadweight burden per dollar of tax revenue, that's just EB divided by R. So take that expression there divided by QD tau, and we get this expression here. One half times the elasticities uh, times D tau over P, so the size of the tax that I'm introducing. All right? And so you can now see how I can go to the data. We've talked about examples before, like the alcohol example, where I estimate the supply elasticity, I estimate the demand elasticity, plug them into this formula, and I have a measure of the efficiency cost of the tax. All right? So that's one method. A second method is to directly look at distortions in the equilibrium quantity. So let's define eta Q as a quantity elasticity, but defined in a slightly different way than you might be used to, which is dQ d tau. So that's just the derivative, the slope. But then normally when we form an elasticity, we'd have whatever's in the denominator here in the numerator there. So we'd have a tau. But instead, I'm going to put a p naught in the numerator. Okay, the initial price in the numerator, and then divide by Q, as usual. So how can we interpret eta Q? It's the effect of a 1% increase in the price via a tax change. Okay, so if the price is $10, tax change is $1, we'd call that a 10% um, increase in the price, right? Uh, and what is the impact of that on the equilibrium quantity measured in percentages? So that's the usual elasticity thing taking into account the fact that prices are going to change endogenously, right? So basically, how much does quantity fall when we introduce this tax in percentage terms? How can you estimate that object, run a reduced form regression of log quantity, so that's how you get the percentages, on uh, tau over p naught, tax measured as a fraction of initial price, and then that coefficient beta is going to be exactly that elasticity you want to measure, right? And we talked before about how you can run these reduced form regressions using various research designs and so forth. All right, so now uh, you can write the excess burden formula like this. Excess burden, again, start from uh, what we had before, uh, just the, the size of the triangle. Now we know that we can write dq as dq d tau times d tau. So slope of the curve times the change in the tax, right? And so then I get this expression here. Uh, and then I'm going to write this in the form of this elasticity that I'm estimating. So I introduce a P over Q times Q over P, and then just uh, uh, you know, do the algebra so that I get 1 half times eta Q times P, P Q times D tau over P squared. So this formula is, again, something we can estimate empirically. It's simpler than the other formula because I don't need to estimate both supply and demand elasticities, right? I can just estimate the reduced form effect of the tax on quantity. That's all I need to worry about. And then I can measure the size of deadweight loss. So what you'll see, this is starting to anticipate a theme of this type of work. There are going to be many different formulas for the same thing that we're trying to measure at the end of the day, like the efficiency cost of a tax or the optimal tax rate. Which formula you use, that, that's what requires some judgment. I think that's the frontier of the field. How do I derive formulas? that are empirically implementable given the data that I have? Uh, what am I actually able to estimate in the data? So you know, to take an example, um, I might not, for whatever reason, have data on how prices changed when I introduced the tax. That doesn't mean that I can't measure deadweight loss. As long as I see quantities, and I know the size of the tax change, and I know the initial price, I can apply this formula. So often, you're going to find cases where you want to estimate the impact of some policy, but you may not have the ideal data and an interesting aspect of the research is figuring out how to make this work with the data uh, you do have. OK, third method uses totally different data. So again, excess burden of a tax, we know, um, wait, is this the third method? Sorry, hang on. So no, no, let me, OK, no, now I'm going to address the question you had raised, Vijay, first before showing you the third method. Uh, marginal excess burden of a tax increase. Okay, so until now we've been talking about introducing a tax. Now we are going to talk about 
increasing the tax rate when we already started with, say, a 10% tax, all right? So we know that the excess burden, the total excess burden of having a tax of rate tau is given by this formula, right, which we derived before in the previous slide. So now consider the excess burden from raising the tax by delta tau given a pre-existing tax of tau. So what is that? That's EB, let's call it of delta tau, which is excess burden evaluated at tau plus delta tau minus excess burden evaluated at tau, right? So that is, um, good, that's what I want to measure. That's the incremental excess burden from adding a tax of delta tau when we've already had a tax of tau to begin with. So how can we write that? We'll just take this formula and put in a tau plus delta tau in the first term and then put in a, just the tau in the second term. So it's the difference between those two. And then I'm factoring out the dq dt. Okay, notice that implicitly I'm assuming that dq dt is constant. It's not changing over uh, over this region, it's a very common assumption that we basically assume the demand curve is locally linear. That's what that assumption is. All right, so then just work out the algebra. What's the difference between these two? You get uh, these terms here, and then you split them out, and you can group this into two separate terms, which have a nice intuition. So this first term is proportional to tau times delta tau. The second term is proportional to uh, delta tau squared. So mathematically, what we say is that the first term is first order in delta tau. It's proportional to delta tau itself. The second term is second order in delta tau. That is, it's proportional to delta tau squared. Where are these two terms coming from? They're coming from the fact uh, that, uh, let me just go back here just to show this. So notice that there's this rectangle here in the middle. And then there are the two triangles. The two triangles are the second order terms. They're proportional to delta tau squared. And the rectangle, the height is proportional to the initial tax rate tau. And the width is proportional to delta tau. So that's the tau times delta tau term, right? So it makes sense that it works out that way. OK, so this now mathematically, you can see this is why taxing markets with pre-existing taxes generates a larger marginal excess burden. So just plug in some numbers uh, just to get a feel for this. Suppose I have a delta tau of 1%. The excess burden of that is going to be 10 times larger if tau is 10% rather than if tau is 0. So if I'm going from 0 to 1, the deadweight cost is proportional to 1% uh, uh, squared. But if I'm going uh, from 10 to 11, the deadweight loss is proportional to 10% times 1%, right? So it's uh, 10 times bigger. And so when we say, often you'll hear people say, you know, to first order, we only care about this. What do they mean rigorously? To first order means I'm only going to pay attention to the first term. The second order term is minor. It's irrelevant. Let's ignore that, right? OK, so uh, just more on first versus second order approximations, because we are going to use that a lot in this class. So another way to, to think about computing marginal excess burden, rather than writing it out like this, another intuitive way to think about it is just take a derivative, right? So you have a formula for the excess burden of a tax, which we wrote down here. What if we just differentiate that with respect to tau? That should give you the marginal excess burden. And that's right. So DEB D tau, the derivative times delta tau, gives you that term. And notice that that's exactly the first order term that was in the previous formula. And that makes perfect sense because a derivative captures the first order properties of a function, right? It tells you the local slope of the function, not the curvature of the function. The second derivative would tell you that. Uh, and so another way to see that is many times we'll take Taylor expansions. So we'll approximate a function using a Taylor series. Uh, and the first derivative of excess burden only includes the first order term in the Taylor expansion. So I can write a Taylor expansion for excess burden around an initial tax rate of tau as the excess burden at tau plus the derivative times delta tau 
plus one half times the curvature times delta tau squared. That's a standard Taylor series expansion, right? Any function can be approximated in that way, any smooth function. Um, and what you can see is that the incremental excess burden, which is the left-hand side minus EB of tau, is the sum of this first order term and the second order term. The derivative is just getting you the first order term and missing the triangles. The triangles add further uh, the second order effect, which we can get when we do it the other way. So the point is the first order approximation is going to be accurate when tau is large relative to delta tau. So take another numerical example. Suppose tau is 20%. So let's say we have an income tax rate of 20%. We're thinking uh, about raising the tax rate by 5%. Which formula should we use? Well, the first term in this expression, the first order term, is going to account for 90% of the deadweight loss. So that's why it's, we say you know, second order less than 10%. Uh, let's not worry about that. However, when you're thinking about introducing a new tax, if you took the first order approach, you would always conclude that the uh, excess burden of introducing a new tax is literally zero, which is not correct because there's the second order effect. And so usually when you're thinking about the excess burden of introducing a new tax, people pay attention to the second order term. Right? OK, so now method three, the leakage in government revenue approach, which is actually not applied as much as I think it could be. I think people don't think about this enough. So uh, to first order, as we've just discussed, the marginal excess burden of raising a tax tau is just the tax rate times DQD tau. OK, now observe that the revenue generated from a tax is Q times tau, right, by definition. So we're going to define what I call the mechanical revenue gain. So think of this as the revenue gain that an accountant would calculate if he assumed that behavior didn't change when we implemented this uh, change in taxes. OK, so people are working X hours. I raise tax rates by 10%. I can predict how much revenue that would generate, right? Because I know total earnings in the economy right now. I can just mechanically say, if we raise tax rates by 10%, revenue is going to go up by 10%. So I know what that number is. And then I can calculate the actual revenue gain. So this actually requires a research design. I need to have a counterfactual and so forth. Um, but. Uh, what is the empirically observed impact of the change in tax on revenue? Call that DRD tau. And what is that going to look like mathematically? You get the Q term, which is the mechanical effect. And then you get the plus tau times DQD tau term, which is the behavioral response, which is where the distortion is coming from. The fact that people choose to work less when you raise tax rates. And so then what do you see immediately? Suppose I take the difference between the mechanical and the actual revenue gain. I get this expression here, which is just minus tau dqd tau, which is exactly that. That's exactly what I want to measure, right? So the shortfall, I thought I was going to get an extra billion dollars of revenue. I only ended up with $800 million of extra revenue. I must have generated $200 million of deadweight loss. That's the point. How can I see that again graphically? Let's go back here. Initial tax rate. What's the first order piece? It's that rectangle. Where is that money coming from? It's coming from the government losing that revenue. This rectangle here, this entire rectangle, is the tax rate times the qu total quantity sold. That's government revenue, right? How much does government revenue fall when I increase the tax? Well, they lose that piece. And that's exactly what deadweight loss is. The government would be collecting money on those transactions because they're generating surplus but now is no longer collecting it because we raise taxes. So that's actually a pretty powerful approach, I think, to measuring the efficiency cost of taxes because it really doesn't require very much data. You don't have to have micro data at all. You just need to know revenues. And if you can measure the right type of tax change and measure this thing, you can really understand what the efficiency cost of taxes are. Uh, yes? Assuming quasi-linear throughout until I tell you that we're going to consider the case with income effects. Now, some of this stuff is going to generalize to the case with income effects, so it's not like it totally disappears. But we are assuming quasi-linear. Yes. OK, so I, you know, some of you might think about doing empirical work related to these issues. I would keep this in mind as a potential technique. Not only in the context of tax policy, but many other policies, you can evaluate the efficiency cost, my sense is, just using government data. 
rather than uh, individual data, which can be very powerful. Okay, so um, so just to you know further reinforce this first or second order thing. Why does the leakage in government revenue only capture the first order term? I just said the government revenue loss is the rectangle proportional to delta tau. The consumer and producer surplus loss are the triangles. So those triangles reflect the fact that the consumer loses some surplus and the uh, producer loses some surplus. That doesn't get picked up in the government revenue loss. Okay, so the way you want, want to think about this is method three is accurate for measuring marginal excess burden given pre-existing taxes. But for the introduction of new taxes, you're going to miss the whole thing if you try to use this approach. And uh, th this is exactly that diagram, the lost government revenue, lost consumer and producer surplus. Okay, So you can go over that. All right, income effects and dropping quasi-linearity. OK, so let's consider an individual with a utility function over n goods now. And I'm going to denote that vector of consumption goods by C. The individual's problem is to maximize U of C. So choose a vector C that maximizes utility subject to this budget constraint where Q is uh, the post-tax price. And then Q dot C is your total expenditure. And Z is your total wealth, right? Everything I'm going to talk about is going to be in the context of buying consumption goods. But you should remember that labor is basically the same thing. Think of either leisure as being one of the consumption goods, or think of labor as being one of the commodities with a price W that's consumed in negative quantity. So it, you know, even though people talk about labor income taxation as a separate thing, it's important to keep in mind that conceptually, basically the theory of optimal consumption taxation applies to the theory, applies to optimal labor income taxation as well. And we'll see a lot of parallels. So let's just go over some basic stuff, uh, notation that we're going to use later on. So let's let lambda denote the multiplier on the budget constraint. Uh, the first order condition for good I is that I set the marginal utility of consumption for a good I equal to lambda times the post-tax price. What's a simple intuition for that? I want the marginal value in, of an additional dollar of expenditure on any good to be equated across all the goods, right, if I'm optimizing. So U prime of CI divided by QI is the amount of extra utility I get by spending an additional dollar on good I, because I get to buy 1 over QI units of the good, and that gives me a marginal utility of U prime of CI. And I want to set that equal to lambda, this fixed number lambda, for all the commodities. Those conditions, there are n of them, are going to implicitly define what we're going to call Marshallian or uncompensated demand functions CI of QZ, so they're a function of the vector of prices and wealth, right? And then they're also going to define another object, which is familiar from price theory, which is the indirect utility function. So given uh, a, a price vector Q and a wealth level Z, I can figure out the, the utility maximizing, sorry, the utility you will have if you maximize, choose the utility maximizing consumption bundle, right? In dynamic models, we will end up calling this the value function. It's basically the same uh, kind of same concept. So that's a very useful thing. Like, what is the uh, what does the objective function look like as a function of prices and wealth if the guy is optimizing? All right. So measuring deadweight loss with income effects. So now the question we really want to ask in a general setting is how much utility is lost because of a tax beyond the revenue transferred to the government. That's the way to think about deadweight loss. We, uh, when I tax you, I take, let's say, $100 away from you. Um, that's fine. That's just a transfer to the government. But you might lose $110 worth of utility, and I want to measure that $10, right? Now, Marshallian surplus by itself does not answer that question when you have income effects. Abstractly, the problem is we just wrote, like, drew that graph. We said, you know, this looks like consumer's willingness to pay. This looks like producer's uh, marginal cost. Let's define this measure of surplus, and we define a measure of deadweight loss. That was not mathematically derived from uh, an underlying utility function. And so what that results in is various problems, which I'm actually not going to spend a great deal of time on in this lecture, 
called path dependence, which people had worked out in, in some detail uh, in the 70s and 80s, when you have taxes on multiple goods. So the idea of path dependence is that you don't have a transitivity property that you would expect should hold. So if I go from a vector of taxes, tau naught, to some intermediate tax system, tau tilde, and then I go from a vector, that vector tau tilde, to some new tax system tau one, I would hope that the total change in consumer surplus would be equal to what I would get if I go from tau zero to tau one, right? I mean, the thing should add up. Like if I raise tax rates from 10 to 20%, 20 to 30%, the total deadweight loss that I get should be if I go from 10 to 30%, right? When you have multiple taxes, that is not true for Marshallian surplus when you have income effects. Can you can show that it has to do with the fact that this, these measures are basically line integrals, and for a line integral to be, not be path dependent, you need, the, um, you need a symmetry property, which is really Slutsky symmetry, and that's why it works for Hicksian demand functions. Okay, the, so that's one problem. I think that's how people recognize that this actually doesn't make sense. The second problem is that you actually need units to measure utility loss, right? So when we say we have this utility function here, and we're going to say, you know, utility falls by some amount when I levy this tax, like what does that mean? That's not a meaningful measure. If I double that utility function, uh, I'm going to lose twice as much utility, and that, you know, that obviously doesn't have any meaning. So what we do then is introduce the expenditure function, which is the dual of the utility function, to translate the utility loss into dollar terms. That is to develop a money metric. Okay, so that's the next thing we're going to do. So hopefully a reminder for many of you, what is the expenditure function? We fix utility at U and prices at some uh, level Q, and we find the bundle that minimizes the cost, the expenditure needed to reach U for that price vector. So rather than maximizing utility given a price vector, we minimize costs given that price vector to attain a given level of utility, the so-called dual of the utility maximization problem. Okay, so mathematically, what is that? I'm gonna call the expenditure function. Think of that as the number of dollars you have to spend given a price vector and some utility level like 10 that you're trying to reach. Um, the number of dollars you have to spend uh, in order to achieve that utility level, and how can we write that? It's the consumption bundle that minimizes Q dot C, that's your total expenditure, subject to this budget constraint, or subject to this utility constraint, right? that you need to maintain utility above that threshold. Let's let mu denote the multiplier on that utility constraint. And then the first order conditions for this problem are gonna be given by something that looks very similar to the utility maximization problem. Here I'm gonna set just differentiate, and you'll see that you set qi, the price of good i, equal to the multiplier times the marginal utility of consumption. So, you know, similar kind of thing, and it makes sense because it's the dual, it's the same problem. Uh, and that is going to generate what we call the Hicksian or compensated demand functions, which I'm going to denote by H of I. It's a, again a function of the price, but now a function of utility. So Marshallian demand maps price and wealth to a given level of demand. Hicksian demand ma maps price and utility to a given level of demand. Right? So now we can define an individual's loss from the tax increase quite intuitively as the amount extra he would have to spend to attain a given level of utility when you introduce the tax. So I can say E of Q1U minus E of Q0U. Q1 is the post-tax prices, Q0 is the pre-tax prices. How much extra expenditure do I need to have in order to achieve a given level of utility, right? And that's very intuitive. And now because we've derived this kind of from the micro foundations, it, this is a, a completely sensible object, it's a single valued function. So that is, if I put in a given uh, tax vector, it's going to spit out a single value for the um, size of that expenditure change. And so it's going to give me a coherent measure of the welfare cost with no path dependence. Right? And so we don't need to worry about the details of establishing that, but it turns out that this is actually a sensible measure of, uh, debt of uh, surplus. OK, but I've left one thing sort of open here which is what is this U? Where do you measure that utility level U? Where do you get that? So that leads to two different 
measures that are commonly used in literature called compensating variation and equivalent variation. Uh, so consider a price change from Q0 to Q1. There are two intuitive utility levels, reference utility levels to think about. One is the initial utility, that is utility before I introduce the tax. So I'm going to call that U0. And that is equal to the indirect utility you obtain with a, given the initial tax vector and wealth level Z. Okay, so just by definition, I'm going to call U0 the level of utility you achieve when there were no taxes. And I'm going to call U1 the level of utility you achieve once the tax system is in place. Okay, so two different reference utility levels. Compensating variation uses U0, and equivalent variation uses U1. Right, and let's talk about how each of these works. So compensating variation. That measures utility at the initial price level. So intuitively, the way to think about compensating variation is that it's the amount an agent must be compensated in order to be indifferent about the tax increase. So uh, mathematically, we define it like this. And we know that the expenditure needed to achieve a utility of U0, given that initial price vector, has to be Z. Z okay? This relates to the fact that the utility maximization problem and the cost minimization problem are going to have the same solution. If I am trying to achieve, you know, find the optimal bundle to minimize costs given the same price vector, it's going to be the same exact bundle as the, what maximizes my utility given that price vector. Okay, and so E of Q0, uh, zero comma V evaluated at Q0, uh, comma Z is uh, going to be equal to Z. All right, so what is that in words? How much compensation is needed to reach the original utility level at the new prices? So let's think about this concretely. Let's say I'm talking to a consumer, and I'm saying I'm thinking about implementing a $2 tax on Coke. How much do you, uh, how much would you pay in order to avoid, sorry, let me get this right. Uh, the TV and EV is always uh, easy to get mixed up. So, uh, so I'm implementing this $2 tax on Coke. Okay, so I've implemented the tax. You've lost some utility as a result. How much money do I need to give you in order for you to be indifferent about that tax increase. That is to bring your utility level back to before I implemented the $2 tax on Coke. That's what CV is, all right? So it's the ex post cost that must be covered by the government in order to generate the same ex ante utility. Uh, and so, you know, another way you can think about it is like this. If I um, take the uh, expenditure with the new tax system and uh, take away CV, then I end up with the expenditure that I had under the old tax system. Equivalent variation measures utility at the new price level. So this is the lump sum amount the agent is willing to pay to avoid the tax. So this is like with the Coke example, if I come to you and say, you had a utility of 10 before I imposed uh, the tax, uh, and you have some lower level of utility now, how much would you be willing uh, to pay? I'm thinking about putting this $2 per can tax on Coke. How much money would you be willing to pay me to not have this tax put on at all and keep the original pre-tax prices? Now, that's going to give me a different number. And we define that like this, where it's exactly the same as CV. But notice I have U1 here instead of U0. Uh, and so as a result, it's being evaluated at the pre-tax prices rather than the post-tax prices. So EV is the amount that can be taken from the agent to leave him with the same ex post utility, OK? So I know this stuff is a bit confusing, but uh, you know, if you stare at it enough, it, the, the key thing to remember, really, is that there, there are two different reference utility levels. And that's going to produce two different deadweight loss measures, both of which uh, one can calculate. And then you can always go back and look up which one is which. <laughs> All right. so. Uh, now, what we want to actually do is derive empirically implementable formulas analogous to that simple Marshallian excess burden formula in the general model with income effects. So uh, just to step back, like this is fine. You know, there's a formula for measuring the excess burden of a tax. But it's much, much less intuitive and much less implementable 
than the, the Marshallian triangle formula we were working with, right? Because there we could talk about various methods of how we'd actually measure it in the data. But you look at this thing and it's like, you know, how do I estimate the expenditure function? Like, I don't know exactly how to take that to the data. So that's what this next bit is going to be about. OK, so once we have income effects, things start to get messy. And so the literature typically makes one of two assumptions. Either we assume that the producer prices are fixed, so that is the supply curve is flat, and we have income effects. Or we assume that producer prices are endogenous, like I was doing before, and we have quasi-linear utility. Now, when you have both of these things, with both endogenous prices, that is an upward sloping supply curve, and income effects, the, if, if the calculation and definition of efficiency cost actually becomes pretty complicated because it depends fundamentally on how you're returning the profits to consumers. Because that's going to end up, so think about like I collect some tax revenue, I rebate that lump sum to the consumers. They end up spending that on some goods, which again affects prices in equilibrium. And then I'm going to have this feedback effect where the prices are changing for multiple reasons. And it's a mess to derive the formulas at that point. Whereas when I have fixed prices, I eliminate that effect, right? Because the price is not changing by definition. And when I have no income effects, I also eliminate that effect because the amount of income I have that you give me that tax rebate, it doesn't affect the amount I buy of the tax good. So I need to kill that channel in order to get relatively simple formulas. So that's what I'm going to do here. If you're interested, our back section 3.2 uh, goes through the case with the multiple things. All right, so let's derive empirically implementable formulas uh, for EV and CV based deadweight loss measures using the Hicksian demand function. So we assume P is fixed and we have income effects. So flat supply, constant returns to scale. The envelope theorem, which you've reviewed in section, implies that the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to the price of good I is just the Hicksian demand at uh, uh, Hicksian demand for good I. Okay, I don't need to worry about any second order effects from the fact that the guy will re-optimize the consumption bundle when you change the price. It's just the first order effect on expenditure, which is just going to be the amount you're spending on the good. And so as a result, remember I'm trying to calculate this quantity here, right? This is the loss in expenditure when I raise prices. Sorry, the increased expenditure when I raise prices. So I can write that then uh, as the integral of the derivative of that function. The derivative of that function is the Hicksian demand function. And so this is just the area under the Hicksian demand function between Q0 and Q1. Uh, which is very similar to like the Marshallian surplus calculation, but using the Hicksian demand, right? If only one price is changing, that's the area under the Hicksian demand curve. If you have multiple prices changing, multiple taxes, uh, that's going to be that line integral over uh, that full vector. So one thing to note before we continue is that the Hicksian demand, given a u indirect utility level, of V of Q comma Z, the indirect utility that you get given a, a wealth level of Z, equals the Marshallian demand at that wealth level. This again comes back to the basic point that these two problems are duals of each other. The cost minimizing solution and the utility maximizing solution to a problem are the same, given the same utility and wealth level. All right? So we're going to use that in a second. OK. So let's now talk about how we measure compensating versus equivalent variation. When we implement a tax that raises the price on this one good from P0 to P1, we are going to talk about two different Hicksian demand curves. The first is measured at the new uh, price, the, the utility level at the new price. And the second is measured at the utility level at the old price. All right, And uh, you can see that, and, and then we're plotting the demand function as a function of price. right? Right, holding the utility level fixed. So the way to think about what this blue curve is showing you is as I vary the price, how much of the good do I need to produce? Uh, sorry, how much of the good do I need to, to uh, consume in order to achieve that utility level at the, in a cost minimizing fashion? Uh, and then this is the same thing at the other utility level. Now, what we'll see in a second is that the Marshallian demand shown by the red 
uh, is going to have a flatter slope than these uh, Hicksian demand curves. That is, there's going to be a bigger change in quantity for a given uh, increase in price. So EV, then, remember, just going back to that integral formula, measures the area under the Hicksian demand curve as measured with the new utility level. And CV uh, measures the um, area under the Hicksian demand curve under the old utility level. So graphically, you can represent EV and CV with these two, um, with these two trapezoids. Okay? Marshallian surplus, the consumer's Marshallian surplus, is given by the slope under the Marshallian demand curve, which in this example happens to be bracketed between EV and CV, but as I'll talk about in a second, is not true generically when you have multiple prices changing. So just so people are clear, let me uh, ask a question. Why does the Marshallian surplus always have a uh, bigger quantity response for a given price range? Why is it always going to have that flatter looking slope than the Hicksian demand curves? Yeah, if the good is normal, yeah, why is that? Right. So there are two reasons that price affects demand in the Marshallian demand curve, the utility maximization problem. When prices fall, you want to buy more of the good because you substitute toward that good. That's there in both of these demand curves. But in the Marshallian demand curve, you uh, feel richer because you now have more money effectively uh, in real terms. And so you want to buy more of the good for a second reason. And so that's going to take you to this point here where you effectively end up moving at price P naught to this Hicksian demand curve. So the fact that these two things intersect is a, a consequence of what I was showing right here, right? That the solution to the expenditure minimization utility maximization problem is the same. And you know that the Hicksian demand curves have to be ordered uh, in this way. And so as a result, you're going to get this uh, flatter slope for the Marshallian demand curve, OK? All right, so with one price change, EV is less than Marshallian surplus, which is less than CV. But that's not true in general with multiple price changes. It comes back to the fact that the Marshallian surplus is ill-defined because it actually doesn't have a single value. It depends upon the way in which you're changing the prices. So initially, historically, people thought of this as a justification for using Marshallian surplus measures instead of these EV-CV measures. But that's actually not rigorous in a multidimensional tax system as we actually have. All right, so let's now finally come to the measurement of deadweight burden with income effects. So this is uh, the change in consumer surplus, which is what we've been talking about measuring. How much total does the consumer lose when uh, the tax is increased? But now we want to subtract out the tax revenue that the government actually gets, right? So uh, some of that $110 utility loss that I experience, $100 of that goes to the government. We need to take that out to calculate excess burden. So again, we have two measures of excess burden that are used in the literature that just correspond to EV and CV. In both cases, you just take the EV measure, subtract out revenue the government collects, take CV measure, subtract out revenue the government collects. They're due to two different, uh, there are two different articles in the literature that do this. So Mooring defines the EV version of excess burden and Diamond and McFadden define the CV version of uh, excess burden, okay? And in both cases, you just take EV and CV, and then you take the size of the change in the tax multiplied by demand by the amount you sell of the good or amount purchased of the good at the relevant point, right? So for EV, you're evaluating everything at the new utility level, so you use uh, the Hicksian demand at the new utility level for CV at the old utility level, okay? And so then what do you get graphically? The government revenue is just the area, the rectangle, to the left. The government's taking that piece. And so then again, you get these triangles to measure the deadweight loss of these uh, introduction of these taxes. The EV measure is the triangle under the Hicksian demand evaluated at the new price. The CV deadweight loss is the area under the Hicksian demand evaluated at the old price. Yep. Is the revenue collected by the government different? Yes. Uh, the revenue collected by the government, because you're going to say that the guy is consuming this quantity, right, at the, at the uh, old utility level, it's going to be this bigger rectangle. And so then that's why you end up with only this triangle. And the revenue collected here is going to be less, because you're evaluating it at two different points. So 
You want to, that's why you need to subtract out the corresponding revenue. All right, so where is this going? So now we're going to get to a, um, an implementable formula in a second, and that, that's what I'll wrap up with. So uh, this, these are the Hicksian-based measures of deadweight loss. Here's what the Marshallian-based measure of the deadweight loss looks like. So you see immediately here a uh, standard property, which is that the Marshallian deadweight loss is going to be bigger than the Hicksian deadweight loss. It's going to overestimate the actual deadweight loss, all right? Uh, so why is that? So in general, CB and EB measures of excess burden are going to differ. But the other important general property is that Marshallian is going to overstate excess burden because it includes income effects. And so this is, I think, something that's important to understand conceptually. So often people say, OK, so we raise taxes, um, and people end up buying a different amount of good, or they end up working less, and so forth. Should we, be, should we count all of that response as being a measure of distortion of deadweight loss, or should we count only part of that? The key thing that you see here is that any behavioral loss <coughs> due to income effects is not, uh, does not generate deadweight loss because it's not a distortion in transactions. So the example I like to give is uh, suppose I have a, um, something like the EITC which transfers money to people and distorts their incentives to work, but might also make them work less because now they feel rich enough they can afford what they want that they don't want to work as much anymore. So that second effect should not be thought of as deadweight loss. Well, how can you think about that intuitively? Suppose I take a very high income person, the person who happened to be born, let's say, uh, get a bequest of a million dollars. Now there's no deadweight loss if that person chooses not to work, right? I mean, if they don't want to work, that's their choice, that's their utility maximizing choice. We shouldn't be trying to implement a tax system to force everyone to work as much as possible. So the fact that income effects make you choose to do something is totally, you know, utility maximizing does not generate any distortion. What we're concerned about is the fact that um, you might be buying less of a good because the price is distorted. Only price effects matter for efficiency. Okay, so I actually am producing $10 of output for every hour I work, and my disutility of labor is only $6, but because there's a $5 tax, I don't do that transaction. That's deadweight loss. But my disutility of labor is really high because I'm really rich and I don't care to work more. My marginal utility of consumption is low. That's not a problem, right? So that's why you want to use the Hicksian measure. That's why you want to measure the compensated elasticity. And it's only in the case with quasi-linear utility, which is why we started with that, that the CV and EV equal the, marginal, the Marshallian deadweight loss, which is the result established by Chipman and Moore in 1980. Okay? Okay, so let's get an implementable formula for excess burden with the Hicksian demand. So consider an increase in the tax tau on good one from tau to uh, tau plus delta t. Let's assume that there are no other taxes in the system. So this is important, and it's going to come back to that question about GE versus uh, general equilibrium versus partial equilibrium. So recall the expression for excess burden. It's the loss in consumer surplus. You can put U as either the new or the old one, minus the tax revenue generated at the relevant utility level. Okay, so this is mathematically what we were measuring before. That's that triangle. Let's now take a second order Taylor expansion to this thing. Okay, this is going to lead us to what's called a Harberger approximation. The approximation is a second order Taylor expansion, basically. So second order Taylor expansion of EB of tau plus delta tau minus EB of tau. Go through algebra very similar to what was on the Marshallian slide, so I won't do that here. You use uh, you know, the envelope theorem. And uh, you're going to get something. So first of all, th that looks like this, right? So it's the slope of the expenditure, sorry, the excess burden function times delta tau plus 1 half delta tau squared times the second derivative of this thing. So let's now do a little bit more algebra. What's the slope of the excess burden? If we differentiate the expression we had on the previous page, this comes from the envelope theorem. That's just the Hicksian demand minus tau dh1 dt. So where is that term coming from? It's coming from this here, the government revenue part. And actually, you may notice the connection here. This is what the deadweight loss, the first order deadweight loss is going to come from. 
And that exactly re reflects the leakage in government revenue. It's coming from the fact that the government is getting less revenue because the Hicksian demand is distorted, right? You can make that connection. And then you have this other mechanical term that comes from the government revenue. So the bottom line is the slope of that thing equals minus tau dh1 dt. And then the second derivative, if you just differentiate that, is minus dh1 dt, the second term, minus tau times the second derivative of that. The okay, second derivative of this is the curvature of the Hicksian demand function. dh1 d tau is the slope of the Hicksian demand function. Uh, the, and then this is the second derivative of that function. All right, so the standard practice in the literature is to assume that this curvature is 0. Now, so that is to assume that the Hicksian demand is locally linear. That, unlike the other approximations, so there are two different, the, one should make an important distinction between approximations and assumptions. Approximations are valid when something happens in the limit, like when taxes become small, which is what all of these approximations are about. Assumptions are things that do not become valid even in the limit. And so this is an assumption. We're going to assume the thing is a straight line. There's no reason for it to become a, for it to be or not be a straight line, right? And so uh, we're just going to assume for simplicity that that thing is zero. Why do we do that? Because empirically, we already have a hard enough time estimating the slope of something. You know, when we get to a point where we're actually able to estimate the curvature of functions, we'll be in really good shape, I feel like, in uh, economics. So, uh, okay, so you, you, let's make that assumption. And then we get this formula for the marginal excess burden of raising a tax. So this is the incremental deadweight cost from raising a tax measured with income effects. And notice that this looks exactly like the formula we had for the marginal excess burden before, except it uses the Hicksian elasticities, the slope of the Hicksian demand curves, instead of the Marshallian demand curves. And that is the so-called Harberger formula, which is very widely applied. So let's stop there. <laughs>